Hi there. Hi there. This is uh, Matt. I, yeah, go ahead. I, this is uh, Matthew Iglesias. I'm a fellow at the Center for American Progress. And this is Matthew Continetti, and I'm a, uh, what am I, associate editor at the Weekly Standard and author of The K Street Gang. This is Blogging Heads TV. Matt, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm fine, too. I think this is actually technically our first Blogging Heads together. If I recall, we, we recorded one uh, last year sometime. But it was and it went south. It was destroyed or perhaps classified. Um, yes. And we, uh, we were also on C-SPAN once. We were. That was yeah. That was uh, that was way back. I think that was in the uh, 04 <laughs> campaign actually. So Indeed. Shows how we're we're maturing. Exactly. Yes. Now now we're on the internet. I, I <laughs> now we're on the the internet. <laughs> uh, it's going to be important in the future. I think. It's a series of tubes. Right. Uh, <laughs> exactly. So I, I thought we'd talk about, well, first of all, I did want to get, you know, I noticed you did not, uh, you had ambivalent feelings about Wolverine. Is that is that right to say? What were your, I have Well, you know, yet. Wolverine, I just, uh, you know, I uh, I had my uh, my cousin's bat mitzvah on Friday night, so I so I didn't go to see it until Saturday, and, mm-hmm. and I'd seen um, my friend's Twitters against Wolverine. And, and so I was, I was set up for like like the worst movie ever, like Fantastic Four two or something like right. that, or, or Daredevil. Right. Um, and it's sil- way better than surfer. those. Right. Yeah. And it's a, uh, it's 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 I thought you know, not that bad. That 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 was how I would put it. Here, here's what my uh, I I haven't seen the movie yet, um, but basically when I look at the phenomenon of superhero movies. It seems to me that they are getting close to the point of jumping the shark. Um, you know, it seems like it made a lot of money. Wolverine did, but I, I'm not sure yes, how much did. there's how much more creative energy is in the superhero franchise. And uh, now I, I think we're going to enter this period of studios kind of looking for the next cash cow. And I'm, so uh, I'm a, I'm a little bit unclear as to what it is. My my coworker Jonathan Last. Uh, who, mm-hmm. Who, who's a kind of a film film buff? He he says it's yes. Star Trek, the new Star Trek, which he saw last night. I haven't gotten his take on it, but he was excited about it. He says that may be the return of the sci-fi film uh, to kind of a big status. I don't know what's your take. Well, I think that would be nice. I mean, I, I I like comic books, so I've been sort of excited at the the comic book movie boom recently. Right. But you know, it's it's probably going too far. Um, you know, you start to get the sense that, well, like in in this case, for example, instead of it really being that there was a a story of Wolverine's origin that was really strong and that they wanted to bring to film, they just decided they wanted to bring to film the story of Wolverine's origin. It turned out there actually was no such story. Um, And so, you know, Marvel (laughs) threw up a a comic book that was the the, the Wolverine origin story, um, and, and it wasn't very good, but because they wanted to you know, at least preempt the movie makers to some extent, constrain them, then they put this movie together, it's not very good, the, the whole idea is sort of sort of ill-conceived, um, you know, and I think it, it wouldn't be a terrible thing for this ground to lie fallow. Um, I think the fact that we went only maybe five years between Hulk movies and, and the reboot of that series, that, that to me was actually the moment when I think it became clear that, that we could use the studios to sort of give this a rest for a decade right, or something. Right, 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 good point. Uh, well, turn, I like the Hulk. From movies to uh, from movies to to, to reading, uh, to so you, saw, you saw the movie on uh, Saturday and on Sunday. The New York Times Magazine published an essay by Russell Shorto, which I think is very interesting. Um, it's called Going Dutch, and it's yes. uh, Russell Shorto is a writer. He wrote, r- writes books. I think his most recent book is on uh, uh, New York, which is funny because it's about old New York and New Amsterdam, its original name and. Of course, now he lives apparently in Amsterdam. He's writing about the um, the experience of living in a uh, you know social democracy like the Netherlands. Well, what I thought was interesting about this piece, he has good things to mm-hmm. say about the, the 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 society in which he now calls home as an American expatriate. Um, he has some flaws, which I'll point out in a second. But sure. it seemed to me that it did a very good job of showing that the quality of life for uh, you know what we can assume to be upper middle class American expatriates in Holland mm-hmm. is okay, but he didn't seem mm-hmm. to actually do much reporting um, to show how the poor 
uh, in, in the Netherlands uh, actually live. And I thought that was a big weakness of the piece. So, well, yeah, so, well, I mean, you know, it was a very sort of Times, Times Magazine-y thing. I mean, I, I had a, a, actually a, a different experience of, of the Netherlands, which mm-hmm. was maybe 18 months ago. No, but it must have been two years ago now. I, I, I went over there to a, a conference that the, the Dutch Labor Party um, was sponsoring. Um, they, they had a sort of affiliated think tank that was – putting out a book about America, I contributed an essay to it, went over to the Netherlands, um, and so we were talking there about, you know, sort of social policy and political problems in the United States and in the Netherlands. In both countries, the left of center power party, rather, was out of power at the time. There was sort of concern about Islamic terrorism, things like that, some similar issues. Um, And, you know, at, at that moment, there were sort of some some stories in the news about um, uh, political protests that, that that had happened in a in a Muslim neighborhood in um, in Rotterdam, I think, rather than Amsterdam, where, where I was. But anyway, I, I went to see what was a a, a poor neighborhood um, mm-hmm. in in the Netherlands, and it was actually really striking how much better conditions were in like a quote unquote bad neighborhood of Amsterdam versus a bad neighborhood of Washington DC or Los Angeles or, or something like that. Um, now they had a, a, a some some social problems there um, related to the, the integration of, of Muslim immigrants that we um, do not have. Um, but in terms of the the material living conditions there, I mean you would see um, the the library in the sort of there was a, it was like a public housing project, and then there was a, a public library there, and it was, you know, filled with school kids uh, studying, you know, quietly, and there was a, a police officer helping an old lady with her groceries, and, you know, the, the kind of stuff that you sort of associate with, with America, maybe from the 1950s, maybe it's not even really true, but sort of, you know, be, better times, more community spirit, um, and, what do and you, people could take advantage of a lot of services. Yeah, what do you attribute that difference to the, the Dutch welfare state well you know I mean I think there's a there's a there's a feedback mechanism in part the the Dutch welfare state helps maintain these things in part the fact that there's a sense of, of order in a lot of these smaller northern European countries makes it more viable to have kind of generous welfare provision I think than so the, the culture matters. The culture matters and, and the institutions matter, right? I mean, I mean, one thing. Well, so so Shorto goes into this in, in his piece in a I think a slightly superficial way, but that, you know, at first he had sort of sticker shock about the high prices in the Netherlands, and then he came to appreciate that well he was getting a lot of good services in return, and in part, you know, that's just because there's there's bigger government in the Netherlands, higher taxes, more services. But in part, it has to do with the um, efficacy with which the services are delivered. And that if you look at the, the sort of the best performing European countries, Netherlands, Denmark, Finland, Norway, uh, places like that, they have really sort of high quality government. You, you know, the, the institutions work very well. The people are, are quite competent. Interactions with them are pleasant. Um, if you look at more, say, Italy or Portugal, um, they have higher taxes in the United States and more services in the United States, but you get more the the quality of services that we associate with America, where many of the schools are not so good, uh, where a lot of people's interactions with the Department of Motor Vehicles, you know, leave a, leave a sour taste in their mouth. So, you know, I mean, I do think the most important thing as a, as a liberal is to not be not be afraid to spend money, but that you have to you have to actually make the money worthwhile. The, the services need to really be good and not just be expensive. I, that's a, I think that's an interesting point. The, um, what struck me about the piece were a few things. One, I, I think he left out the true cost of uh, the Dutch welfare state. He does mention the, uh, the 52% uh, tax rate on income. Mm-hmm. Um, I, he doesn't, I don't know the, du- the Dutch tax system. I don't know whether it's progressive like ours, so I don't know whether that's a flat rate that 52% or whether he's in a higher bracket or what bracket he is in the Netherlands. But he says that's right. fi- that's 52% of his income. But he never mentions um, the the VAT, which I believe is 19% um, on, on all products. And uh, he, right. al- he also mentions the um, – and there are, are there additional taxes as well. He mentions early on in the piece 
how uh, quaint it is that he rides his bicycle everywhere. Well, there's a reason for that, and the reason for that is um, there's a 40% uh, car tax, I'm told, uh, per vehicle, as well as uh, fuel taxes, which which rise, you know, raise the price of fuel to about, I think, $7 is the equivalent, um, a gallon. So, th- I mean, it, th- there is a cost to all of this. Um, I, it's hard for people in Washington sometimes to understand the concept that there's no such thing as a free lunch, uh, because there are so sure. many free lunches here. But the money has to come from somewhere. And the Dutch, it right. seems, uh, I don't know their debt-to-GDP ra- ratio or how big their deficit is, mm-hmm. um, but they tax a lot. And what that does, it yes, seems... Yes, very high taxes. Yeah, they're very high taxes. And uh, you talk about the services they have, but it seems it's very political. I, I, for, from my perspective, um, I, rather than the Dutch or the American government giving me an allotment for my vacation, which is what he, he, he has in the piece, he mm-hmm. says it just appears in his ATM, uh, you know, they, they tax at the front end, and then, then they politically determine how much you're going to spend on vacation. I would say, well, why, not, why don't you keep the taxes low, and then I can determine how much I spend on my vacation. Um, I guess that's just the, the liberal conservative difference, though, isn't it? Well, you know, I, I actually think that the vacation thing is a, is a little bit idiosyncratic. I, I mean, the main difference is that there are certain uh, services provided there which are, are difficult to provide on a sort of a, an individual basis, right? I mean, it's things like people use their cars sub- substantially less there, in part because the taxes are much higher, in part because there's much better trams, there's much better sidewalks, there's much better bicycle facilities. They have um, it's also, programs. It's for, also extremely they, they have, small. It's also extremely small, right? It's a, it's, a, it's an extremely. I mean, it's it's densely populated. It's right. like um, it's it's like New Jersey. But yeah, it's a population of 16 million, so twice the population in New York and a country the size of New Jersey. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, and, you know, uh, but, and they, they do things like they have sort of community child health centers, you know, little sort of places in the neighborhoods where you can come in and, you know, your kid gets gets treated if he's sick or if you just need some kind of, you know, advice about, you know, what, what you do, coping with these problems. And, I mean, of course, it has a, a redistributive impact, you know, um, the... Uh, the, a lot of these are services that, that upper middle class Americans, you know, can purchase on their own, but that poorer Americans can't afford to purchase in the Netherlands by taxing a lot and then putting it back through the government ringer. You get a, a much flatter um, sort of distribution of consumption goods than, than you have in the United States. And, and I mean, of course, that is probably the main difference between left and right is that, you know, uh, on the right, there's a, a desire to to privatize more of this stuff. Um, on the left, there's a desire to, to socialize more of it. But that's not that's not about just about making things collective. It's about making things more more equally shared across. Um, the United States is a, is a very high inequality society. Um, the Netherlands uh, is, is much lower. Um, but, you know, it, it is true that you have less as a, particularly as a prosperous person, there's more sort of um, constraints on what you can do there because do the taxes are. Do you high. think that there? Um, so right, there, there's a trade-off. The, um, America has more inequality, but the promise of reward if you get uh, into the higher el- echelons, middle class, upper middle class, or you know affluence, uh, is yeah. much greater. Than in than yes. in the Dutch system, you would say. And wouldn't you say that that's maybe one of the reasons why it, people continue to immigrate to America? Um, th- th- this promise of greater reward, greater risk. There's no doubt about it, but also potential greater rewards. Well, I don't really. I, I mean, I think people immigrate to the United States from Mexico because the United States is clearly. A yeah, but that's not Mexico is <laughs> not the only place where. Where people are immigrating. Oh no, no, no! To, 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 to be sure, I mean, but of course, there there are lots of immigrants uh, in the Netherlands as well. They come from Indonesia, they come from Suriname, they come from uh, some places in in North Africa. Uh, you know, so I, I mean, the the main difference in the number of immigrants that actually get to any given developed country is how many immigrants they choose to let in. I think we in the Netherlands uh, let in a, a similar number of people. Canada lets in a, a higher percentage. Um, Finland lets in a lower percentage. I mean, I'll say this. There was a a Brookings study that came out, I think in 2007, and it looked at the question of um, intergenerational income mobility in in different countries. And it showed that Americans 
place a much higher value on, on social mobility and believe that our society affords a, a great deal of, of social mobility. And it's, it's one of the main things Americans like about America is that kind of openness and mobility. Uh, but they found that the United States actually has less social mobility than most European countries, more than the UK, but, but less than Denmark, less than Finland, less than Germany, less than France. So it, it, it's a very important part of American psychology, you know, the idea that um, sort of anyone can make it big here and that the rewards for making it big will be, will be very large. Um, but it's, it's actually quite difficult to, to move up from... From the lower why do you, why do you think it's difficult? Classes. Why do you think it's difficult? I, you know, I think it's difficult because, uh, primarily because of, of disadvantages in, uh, in in human capital accumulation. That poor children start school already behind uh, middle class and, and and richer kids, and then they are served very poorly by the school system and to some extent by the healthcare system. Um, and I think you know that that pretty much explains it. The um, it's it's interesting to me because the, it, the short of piece was very revealing. I sense a great tendency on the left, um, it, the American left, um, these days to really push for uh, America to move toward a European style social democracy. We have a welfare state in the United States. Uh, we'd agree on that. Basically, it covers um, uh, old people. <laughs> it covers <laughs> retirees. That's the ba- that's. That's where our, our main uh, welfare state is. There's also some for, mm-hmm. for young people, that is, uh, you know, dependents. And then, of course, yes. um, there is still cash welfare payments to uh, single mothers and stuff. Though that was uh, reformed in 1996. We have a welfare state in the United States. The one missing component of it is um, a universal health insurance program, a national health insurance program. Yes. That, that's one of the highlights uh, in Shorto's piece. It said, well, everyone has uh, in the Netherlands um, health care, universal health care. Okay. What was interesting to me, though, is he, he, he mentions it um, all, only briefly in the piece, but in fact the Dutch recently reformed their system to increase competition, uh, to increase choice, and uh, yes. to inject more free market mechanisms into, the, into this universal program. Um, yes. Which would seem to me to show that there are limits to what a national health care system can do without you know, some sort of competition and choice. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, 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 there's a huge variety in, in what national health care systems look like. I right. mean, this is one of the reasons the congressional debate on this is very complicated, right? I mean, if, if there were one single thing that was, you know, a universal health care system, mm-hmm. then we could have a debate about whether or not, you know, that thing was a good idea. Um, but if you look, I mean, the healthcare care system in Switzerland is very different from the system in France is very different from the system in Canada. Uh, so there's a, sort of a, a whole range of things. Um, the United States, obviously, coming at this from a, a much more market-oriented status quo, I think is likely to move to something along the lines of, of the Swiss system or the new Dutch system, um, whereas the Dutch had previously, I think, had had a system that was more like what's in place in, in Germany. Um, you know, and, and clearly there's a, there's a desire to try to maintain um, choice and competition among healthcare providers, right? Among sort of doctors and hospitals. That's that's something that that people like a lot, um, and that there's some kind of results for. And that has a, it's related to the question of health insurance, but it's not totally the same. So that, for example, on on Medicare, we have a, a completely government-run insurance system. But the actual delivery of healthcare services is entirely in private hands. Um, so you can have the two. I, I, I don't actually think it works all that well. But um, old people and voters are, are very enthusiastic about Medicare. So you know that's sort of what you get. Um, just one more question I have on, on this piece. Um, it, it seems to, okay, but you would agree though that you know, the left right now they they want they want to move America more toward a system like the Netherlands or, you know, more like Denmark, say, or Finland. You, you, you've been to Finland. You, you enjoy Finland yes. very much. So basically, we want to push us in the direction of a northern European social democracy. Is that fair? Certainly, I do. Yes. Yeah, right. And I think you're representative of, uh, of the left, especially kind of younger uh, folks on the left. Mm-hmm. My question, whenever I, I confront this, there are, to me, there are reasons um, that America... 
hasn't already been to that place, why we don't have um, a, a fully developed um, social democracy. And Many reasons. I, I think the left would say well, the primary reason is corporate power. Uh, that's why that's what's been stopping us and entrenched special interests and you know we have the Senate and stuff and it's hard to okay. it's much harder to reform. I'm not so sure about though uh, that though and w what what came across to me in this piece was some conversations that Shorto, an American who is enjoying his life over there, and the American expatriates yes. tend to enjoy their life simply because they're they have the means to move to another country to begin with. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to think that they wouldn't have a better quality of life if they moved anywhere else. Uh, or worse. Um, he's talking with the Dutch and they say, well, listen, you know, the, the, the pillars of Dutch society are consensus and security. Right. Right. And I look at, I look at American society and, um, you know, consensus and collectivity, you do not describe this America. They, they don't at all. I would say rather we're a nation of disputatious, argumentative mm -hmm. individuals. Uh, and also extremely diverse. The Dutch, um, if you look at the co ethnic composition of the Netherlands, about 80% of this population of 16 million, this very small population, mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. are ethnic Dutch, and the rest are 20% immigrants. Um, you know, I'm not sure where most of the Dutch immigrants come from, probably um, Muslim-speaking countries in Africa, uh, Muslim uh, countries in Africa. It's, right? it's, it's Suriname in Indonesia. Oh, so in Indonesia, the right. Well, of course, they have, they have a historical legacy there, right. Right, um, exactly. So, so it's a much more homogenous country than ours. Oh yeah, of course. And uh, a much more consensus-based culture than ours. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't that be uh, almost a... Do you set, let me phrase it this way. Do you sense that our sure. culture is changing more in line with, uh, with the, what you would find in the Northern European social democracies? Uh, no, I mean, I think the United States, uh, you know, is a, is, is a very different place. It's why we have very different policies. I, you know, the, the, the question that's difficult, right? I mean, there's definitely an association between relatively small, relatively homogenous populations and a certain kind of politics and, and policy environment. Um, the reason um, American policy isn't like Finnish or Dutch or Norwegian policy is that the United States isn't like Finland or the Netherlands or, or Denmark or, or any of those other places. Right. The, the, you know, there's there's a question of whether that's um, you know a sort of a, a intrinsic, right? I mean, is it that um, the kind of school system that they have in Finland or the kind of worker training programs that they have in Denmark actually couldn't be made to work? in a large, more diverse society, which I don't really think? Or is it just that it's it's much more politically difficult to, you know, persuade people that it would be a good idea, uh, which I think certainly is the case. I mean, uh, America, um, we have different political institutions. We have different traditions. We have uh, different kinds of people who have different kinds of interest. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't think, I, I think it's, a, a lot of conservatives, I mean, Mitch McConnell has led the way on this, some other conservatives, in saying that, you know, Barack Obama is going to transform America in, into a European-style welfare state. And frankly, um, you know, I, I would do that if I could, um, and maybe Barack Obama would, but I don't think he will. I mean, it's not and the primary a reason simple short-term goal. Right, but the primary reason you would do that is because you would have more equality, right? You, you would, you want to do that because the median the 50th percentile person in Iglesias land would ha would be better off than the 50th percentile person in the United States of America, right? That uh, yes, I believe they'd so. have more they'd have more government services and, and such. We'd be leveled. The population would be leveled, right? Well, and I, I also think I mean not just leveling, but I think that ultimately it, it would allow for a better sort of long term growth prospects. So you're have, you're dissatisfied with the quality of life. Um, the standard of living of the person in the 50th percentile in the United States today? Well, I mean, to be clear, I mean, I think everyone needs to understand that anyone who is alive today in the United States of America or in the Netherlands is far better off than the vast majority of people in the world presently or through historical circumstances. I mean, uh, politics largely consists of disagreeing about, you know, domestic economic arrangements. Uh, so, you know, we... we spend a lot of time on the kinds of differences between these countries. But, you know, in the scheme of things, um, 
the median American is, is extremely well off and, um, you know, minorly improving or um, worsening their living standards is not, you know, I think in, in God's eyes, it's sort of not that big a deal what kind of healthcare system we have uh, in that sense, right? I mean, the biggest problems in the world are in China, they're in Africa, they're in India, things like that. Right. But I mean, I do think we could do better in the United States and ought to try. Right. And, but the, again, the money has to come from somewhere. I would, I would say this, though. It, it, the, um, yeah, the political system is different than uh, here than it is in those nor Northern European uh, countries. And, um, but the, the sense of community is different. The right? sense I mean, of community is different. The, the space is different. We are this huge, huge country of uh, more than 300 million people. The ethnic composition is different. We have about two-thirds are what we do call white Americans, descendants of European mm -hmm. immigrants in the United States. A third, then, are uh, everyone else. Uh, so there is more, much more ethnic diversity. There's regional diversity. Um, there's, uh, you know, a political diversity. The, actually, not as much, you would say, as, as you might find um, in some of the other uh, parliamentary democracies across the world. Um, and, and their cultural diversity, certainly, because of this uh, overall arching culture of, uh, of what I would say disputatious, you know, individualism. People, people like to have their identities, and they like to argue about it, and they don't like people who don't share their identities, whatever they construct them to be. Um, if, I would just, as a, coming from my right of center perspective, I'd say, well, okay, well, let's look at this country that we have, this amazing, powerful, rich, beyond the wildest dreams of avarice country, and then let's look, let's see how we can keep that, those, those qualities while also maybe, maybe marginally improving the condition of the person in the 50th percentile. Seems to me the, 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 uh, the left either doesn't think that those characteristics are all that important that I've laid out, the uniqueness of America, um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, at the end of the day, they're not that, they don't matter because it, because we need to make sure that the income distribution is as, you know, reasonably flat as it can be. You know, I, I mean, I, I really don't think that's right. I mean, I mean you know, the, the whole thing with Europe, to, to be honest, I mean, this is a, an argument that conservatives really started when Americans were just trying to talk about, you know, ways to change our own policies. People started saying, oh, it's going to be terrible. It's going to be like Europe. So, you know, people come back. No, that's not true. European that's country. not true. I've read John Cohn in the New Republic saying Denmark is the way to go. Robert Kuttner has said the same thing. On your blog, well, that's you true. Said, there is, there you, is this. on your blog, you said uh, Finland. After your trip there, you said Finland was God. What, you know, why why can't we be more like Finland? Uh, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not the totally no, no, right. No, 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 no. Right, right. And look, I mean, I think there's lots of. But I don't think anyone. I mean, you read you read John Cohn's article about about Denmark. You read my article about Finland. You know, I mean, everyone is aware that you cannot transform the United States into a small Scandinavian country, right? I mean, it, it just, that doesn't really mean anything as a proposition. And, and you know, so obviously... What's the point of these articles? The, it's to show how they do policy there and... Well, it's to show how they do it, policy there. I mean, it's, it's, it's to show that, you know, there are existing models of high-tax, high-service, high-growth economies, um, which is an important you know, sort of point to make. Um, you know, I mean, it's, when, when you look into really concrete sort of issues, right, in particular, just the greater geographical diversity of the United States makes a huge difference. I mean, the United States has multiple large metropolitan areas, uh, which is not, you know, the case in, in small countries, which usually have one big city, that city has suburbs, then people live in, in sort of miscellaneous small towns. So you can do different kinds of planning. Um, but, you know, I mean, when you talk about things, right, like, does it show that having, investing more money in retraining displaced workers can help build political support for free trade, it can help people find jobs? You know, Denmark is a pretty good example. If there were other giant rich countries, <laughs> I think not. we could learn more from them, but there aren't. Is there right? really I mean, a political debate in America about retraining displaced workers? I mean, I, didn't John McCain run on exactly... I mean, I, I don't think there was any difference between the two major candidates in the last election. The debate... It, the, the no, debate no, no, no. I mean, I mean there, 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 there wasn't. I mean, that's exactly the point. I mean, right. neither so, candidate yeah, was the proposing real, anything nearly as ambitious. You would agree that the debate... The, but the debate that you would like to have, right, is how high do taxes need to go to provide these services that, that you would like to provide, right? That's the debate. Um, well, I mean, I think it's a... Uh, 
you know, I mean, obviously, you know, Democratic Party politicians don't want to say, well, we should have much higher taxes. Um, you know, I think, in fact, we probably should. Right. Um, but that's, I mean, anyway, all, all I was saying is that there are only so many countries in the world, um, besides the United States and Japan, there aren't any other, like, big, rich countries. Um, so, you know, you, you have to, if you want to try to draw any conclusions from foreign countries, you wind up drawing conclusions based on much smaller countries, and that's not, I mean, that's not really anybody's fault. Um, as best I can tell, absolutely no one thinks the United States should be more like Japan. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, not that's, especially with their recent economic performance, and even there, the parallel is even worse, because God, uh, what's the ethnic composition of Japan? I mean, it's, must be 90%, it's, 95%. They're very, very yeah. homogenous. Yeah, it's extremely very homogenous. homogenous. I and think he, actually Steve's, Steve Saylor likes to talk about Japan. <laughs> the science, I, I, I think we'll, we'll move on to another topic, but I think this is the sure. core, and I think that the, here's what we can do is transition. The, when Arlen Specter left the GOP uh, last week, he didn't give as his reason his pro-choice stance. He's been pro-choice yeah. for decades. That's not why he left the party. A lot of the social conservatives in the party get a lot of heat. Oh, you're you're you know you you're rejecting heretics and whatnot. But no, that's not why he left. Sure. Why, why he left was his vote on the stimulus, which I think is going to turn out to be with a dividing line in American politics. Um, in a way, even that the Iraq vote wasn't because the Iraq vote was so bipartisan. I mean, uh -huh. know, majorities in both parties uh, supported it, at least in the Senate. Not not in the House. Right. Most, most House Democrats are against the rap In any case, the stimulus, you have a real dividing line about the size of government. And that's why Arlen Specter was ejected, or rather felt he had to leave the party. Um, he, wasn't, mm -hmm. he wasn't ejected like Joe Lieberman was in the 06 uh, Democratic but primary. But I mean, he would have been. Right, I mean, Specter was on yeah, the yeah, yeah, but he never, he never, primary. he never just, and it looked right, yeah, at the end of the day, but we never had the contest, so. Um, so Basically, what I want to know from you, my question for you is what, this is a, listen, the Big Ten, the Republican Big Ten has been packed up, it's been shipped, who knows, it's someplace in, in Tennessee or somewhere, it's in cold storage. Sure. Waiting. The, the tent is over, uh, we have partisan ID uh, for Republicans at decades low support, we have 60 Democratic senators when uh, Al Franken is being seated um, mm -hmm. for the first mm -hmm. time since the, the Carter presidency. Basically, the GOP is at it, as, as its nadir, um, uh, basically, it's returned to where it was post Watergate, post seventy four election, mm -hmm. and post seventy six election. And as a, uh, my question for you is, what are you guys at the Center for American Progress Action Fund doing to make this permanent? What do you think would make this type of thing as permanent as possible? Stipulating that there are no permanent majorities. Uh, sure, in sure. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I think you, you know, obviously, uh, people sometimes deride the. Um, uh, you know, nonpartisan credentials of, of someplace like the center. Um, but speaking for myself, I mean, I fully expect the Republicans to be back and to be back pretty soon. I mean, maybe they'll lose ground in the next two elections and they'll be back in, in 2014. Why, um, do you, why do you think they're going to be back? Because, I mean, that's just how American politics works. You know, there's a, there's an ebb and a flow to it. The geography of the Senate races two years from now is bad for them. And if the economy is recovering, Barack Obama will be reelected. Um, so that's, you know, relatively pessimistic uh, on the Republicans. But right. then the geography of the Senate races will be better, you know, in, in the midterms right. after that. Right. The economy is sure to go down again. Um, and so, you know, I don't... I don't personally spend too much time worrying about how to get Republicans to, to, to lose elections or to, to get voters not to vote for them. The question is, is you know, what kind of Republican Party uh, comes back, right? Is it a more moderate party or is it the kind of party that's being built right now, which is, you know, very conservative sort of across the board on everything. And because of the way American politics and American political institutions work, it's it's extremely hard to, to sort of, you know, do things um, with one party being just really fundamentally opposed to any kind of constructive action on, on climate, to any kind of, you know, provision of public services, things like that. So, you know, I, I don't totally know what, what can happen because I'm, I'm pretty sure Republicans will, will be back 
pretty soon, one way or the other. You know, I, I hope people do things like, uh, you know, read Ross Douthat's column today and, and think of ways to sort of, you know, not bring back, like, Arlen Specter style, you know, I'll cut a deal with whomever, but, you know, think of some real ideas about how to tackle problems. I think there's, you know, a, a lot of... I, I don't think that, like, free market economics is bunk and there's, like, nothing to be said for it. That's pretty um, sure. But I don't think... I, I don't think that Mark Pence, uh, Mike Pence and Eric Cantor are really um, offering an important contribution to, to the American policy. So you would say that you spend less time worrying about Republican power and more time worrying about conservative power. That's what you would say. Well, you know, I, I don't think even conservative or, or not conservative. Because, so what do you, you spend know, time worrying that, about? What? Oh, well, you know, I mean, sure. I mean, conservative is defined in a certain... I think a big problem in the United States is the um, just sort of obsession with the sort of Grover Norquist style, you know, no tax can ever go up under any circumstances for any reason kind of thing. I, I think America could become a much better place if we could if we could move beyond that idea. And why do you think, I mean, the reason that he's against all taxes is because he doesn't want to grow government, right? I mean, in part that's why it is, but in part it's because he's kind of a, I, I think, an idiot. I mean, you know, I, I remember, for example, um, there, w there was a debate, this was maybe a month ago on, on the corner, and Jerry Taylor was trying to say that things like the, the tax deduction for home ownership, right, that those kind of... Um, subsidies that are done as tax cuts, right, that that really constitutes government intervention in the economy, right. and that it would make sense to get rid of some of those kind of deductions. And he was getting a lot of heat from other people who were saying, well, since when is someone from the Cato Institute for tax hikes? You know, and I, I just think it's a, that's like a way too simplistic way of looking at it, right? The, the 1986 tax reform that, you know, was, I think, one of the major accomplishments of the Reagan administration that um, Senator Bob Packwood, who's a Republican, was, was a major actor for. I think that, you know, that was a really good piece of legislation. It was something that was done in a bipartisan way. But it's something that I think the current rules of conservatism would rule off the table because it, 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 it was on net. You know, revenue neutral, but it did make some taxes higher. Right. And, you know, you just, you can't talk about that kind of thing in, let me, in let me make, the Republican Party. Let me make two points. One, I, uh, I, Grover Norquist is not an idiot. Um, and I say that as someone who has criticized him in the No, you know, you're right. I shouldn't he's have said that. Idiot. I've talked to him and he's, he's not. Fact, he's you're, extremely you're, smart and he's worth reading. And he does, uh, I think his beliefs are genuinely held. He thinks the power to tax is the power to destroy. He doesn't like big government. He knows that the more revenue, as you know, the more revenue the government gets, the more services it can provide, and he doesn't want the government to provide services. That's an ideological sure. difference. Uh, now, that said, that stipulated, there is knee-jerk Republican reaction to, um, uh, or, or conservative reaction, I should say, to revenue increases. Um, I'll give you an example. When, when Bush outlined his uh, market health care plan, in the, uh, I believe it was the 07 State of the Union Address. Um, this is the plan later adopted, modified slightly by John McCain. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of Republicans, House Republicans, didn't know what to do. They didn't know whether to support the president's plan because they thought since it would begin to tax benefits, uh, health care benefits, while also providing individuals a, a, a tax uh, credit, I believe, uh, or deduction, either way to purchase the insurance on the open market, they thought that would be a net tax increase, they were opposed to tax increases, whatever. I was told that actually Norquist would inform the House GOP members, excuse me, that uh, don't worry about it, you can support it because you can always shave off, you know, you can shave off the, um, you know, the, the phone tax or whatever in order to get uh, to uh -huh. revenue net neutral point. But you're right, there is kind of this ad hoc opposition, which I think it is troubling for the GOP in this sense, which is that we are uh, accumulating debt um, at the point that it's just unsustainable for a great power. Um, and uh, there's going to be a trade-off down the line, which is, uh, mm -hmm. do you want to continue to be a great power or not? And if you do, you can't, you can't, you can't sustain this level of spending, with, with this, this level of deficit spending. Two ways to handle that. One way is to increase revenue. And there I think the discussion ought to be about 
Uh, and this is what I think maybe Ross hints at in this column. He doesn't go this far, but it, it is an excellent column today. Um, he, it, you know, how do you do that? Do you do that in ways that won't punish the economy? Uh, do you do that by taxing things we should have less of, say like carbon, uh, and maybe lowering taxes on things that we should have more of, like jobs, like work? Um, or do you do that by across the board income tax uh, income tax hikes? Um, mm -hmm. And then the second part of it is, at some point, I think GOP people they're starting it with earmarks, which is stupid because earmarks are such a small part of the federal budget. You have mm -hmm. to constrain overall government spending in order to get these imbalances in order. And I I do think that the, again going back to the stimulus as a real dividing line in American politics, it's going to be spending where you're going to have most of the debates in American politics in the age of Obama. And I, I, don't, know how that will, I don't know how that will play out. How, what, how do you think? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the dilemma of, of sort of spending politics is that the controversy around spending it seems almost inversely proportional to the amount of money that's actually spent on sort of a, a given program. Right. I mean, as you were saying, earmarks have come under under enormous attack to the point where, you know, Barack Obama had a lot of sort of anti earmark talk in his campaign. Um, Senator Claire McCaskill is a Democrat. She's very passionate about clamping down on earmarks. But as you say, there's like there's almost no money, you know, involved in earmarks. Um, by contrast, Medicare is really expensive. I mean, a ton of money is, is spent on Medicare. And there's a lot of evidence that that money is not spent very effectively. And, you know, Peter Orzag has a lot of slides about this. It's something that, that liberal sort of wonks are very well aware of. Um, and yet there's no political interest whatsoever, you, you know, from, from Republicans or from Democrats. Well, that's because, that's sort because of in the past. In getting control of that. That's because in the past, 1995, when, when the GOP yes. tried to constrain Medicare costs, the government was shut down, and the Democrats were able to tar the GOP quite effectively as opposing increases uh, and benefits for seniors. I think it's wait, 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 no, 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 no. I mean, I mean, right. I mean, of course. I mean, you know, and I don't think. I mean, there were there were other issues in that in that specific um, debate, and but but I mean, uh, that, that was the point, right? Is that the the kind of spending that it's politically easiest to attack is the kind of spending that's like small dollar and, and trivial, whereas the big spending, right, which is Medicare, Social Security, and the Defense Department, right, that's where nobody, you know, wa wants to say they're for cuts. Right. Um, I, so I think it's it's, it's difficult to have, um, it, it's hard for me to know what a political debate oriented around spending that's going to leave you know, all the biggest spending items off the table is going to look like. Well, um, I'm not sure. And I, I, I think it may look pretty silly. Yeah, no, it would look silly, but I'm not sure the big items are going to be left off the table. I wrote it, mm -hmm. I wrote, recently wrote a piece for the Weekly Standard about this Safe Commission Act. Uh, Frank Wolf is behind it, the Virginia GOP congressman. He's got Jim Cooper, the leader of the Blue Dogs, the Democrat from Tennessee, behind it. Again, it's, it's government by commission, which has always shown mixed results in Washington, but it does have a mechanism in order to address Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and taxes. And also say, this, the commission would report out saying, okay, we, got, we have structural deficits. They are right. unsustainable, especially with the levels of additional spending that Obama is proposing. Uh, so that's one method. We, we could see, I think, uh, the big ticket That'd be items. an interesting commission. It would be, and I, I think you could see the big ticket items on the, the um, on the table. The White House is adamantly opposed to such a commission. I will say this: if only Nixon could go to China, maybe only Barack Obama can reform Medicare. And Orzag, you're absolutely right. The Ryan was a piece profile of Orzag was really interesting and went into his methods um, of, of con cost control in Medicare. Um, the comparative effectiveness research is part of that. The health uh, information technology spending is part of that. Um, uh, down the line, it's going to, I, I think, uh, Obama in his interview with David Leonhardt uh, that was published in the NYT magazine over the weekend, mm -hmm. you know, giving this uh, heartbreaking story of his grandmother and having to have uh, the hip replacement and such. Right, with the hip, yes. You, you have the sense that they're going to move in the direction where, uh, kind of like a progressive indexing thing, where wealthier recipients of Medicare are going to have to pay more in order to get some of these you know, actuarially costly items, replacing the hip of a 90-year-old who doesn't, probably doesn't have much longer left anyway. That will be an interesting debate. I will say, if you can do it, 
If he does propose it, Republicans in the interest of the country would be well served working with him in order to train these entitlements because it's the only way. The only way they're going to get reformed is by Democrats taking the lead. And so this would be a good pl opportunity for the GOP as constructive critics would be say, yes, we want to work with you. The big missed opportunity in Bill Clinton's second term, uh, we, we, we have plenty of indications that Bill Clinton mm -hmm. wanted to reform Social Security in his last two years. Probably not in a way you would have liked. Nonetheless, he did want to re reform it. Sure. He couldn't because of the partisan warfare over the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Again, right. it, it would take the Democratic president to reform entitlements. Do you think that's right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's that's probably correct. And, you know, I mean, and I think there's, you know, there's some indications of, of interest in that. I mean, I saw, I saw a, a story quoted... Um, it was, I think it's Karen Tomalty's new, new piece in Time, and it's talking about Obama meeting with some um, Republicans about, about health care. And I think it's uh, Obama is saying, well, you know, maybe we should look at uh, curbing malpractice lawsuits, uh, you know, something conservatives talk about. And he said, well, you know, what do you guys, um, what, 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 what would you guys, you know, give me on health care, you know, if we did that? And... They basically, you know, they had nothing because they were kind of, you know, house guys and, and a little confused. Um, and and that was over, like, pretty small bore stuff, right? Um, it would take, I think, bigger thinkers, bigger bigger men than we may have in the Congress on, on both sides, um, not just men, women too, of course, um, to sort of, you know, to say – to say to him, President Obama, you know, you're talking about, about malpractice, but, like, let's talk about serious cost controls in Medicare. You know, and then Obama says, whoa, you know, like, that's big. I need something really big in return. And then they come up with something, right? I mean, that kind of big, big deal-making. It's it's hard to imagine, and that's what gets people... So you're saying swapping out. support for something like the public option with for cost controls in Medicare. Well, for some, I mean, something like a healthcare system that covers everyone the way Medicare doesn't, but that is not so um, ex so hugely expensive on a per person basis the way Medicare is, right? I mean, because right now we have this weird system where, like, if you're under sixty five, the government does like nothing useful for you in terms of healthcare, but if you're over sixty five you get a system that's so generous that people get a lot of, um, you know, services that appear to be unnecessary, um, where even very wealthy people pay very small shares out of pocket. And it doesn't, I mean, there's historical reasons why we developed that way, but that's not, it's, it's, not fiscally, it's not fiscally sustainable, and it also doesn't particularly serve the social justice objectives that, that you know, liberals have. Yeah. No, I think that's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to think of some some uh, chip that Republicans could potentially swap. I mean, the public option, for various reasons, about the size of government, I think is a non-starter for Republicans. They're going to oppose it. Um, it'd be wise, uh, while well, this will all be in reconciliation anyway, so they, you know, they'll be right to oppose it. Um, doing well, S-chip, I'll give you an example. I have no idea why Republicans oppose S-chip. Being against health care for kids... <laughs> it's got to be the stupidest. Yeah, well, that's 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 a tough one. It's got to be the stupidest you know. thing. You know, it's just if I were a Republican leader, you say, okay, President Obama, I'll get you. I mean, they don't need the votes anyway. So Republicans, in some ways, are marginal to this entire debate. But right. you would say, okay, I'm going to support you. Basically, what Republicans want is the government will take care of you after you retire, and they'll take care of you before you become an able-bodied adult. But in between those years, we have a free market plan that we want to implement. Uh, where you, you get a tax uh, credit or deduction, um, and you, you, we were going to increase competition, so you're buying health care insurance. Health insurance will be mm -hmm. a lot like buying it, uh, auto insurance and such. Um, that's what we want in between those years. But we're, we're welcome to work with you on the years below 18 and the years above 65. Or, since I personally think we need to raise the retirement age to somewhere closer to 70, wherever that retirement age is... Uh, is uh, is placed. That to me uh, would be sensible compromise politics. Would would you do you agree? 
no. You know, I, I don't think I would frame the compromise in exactly that way. Um, but I mean, maybe you know, I mean, this is wait. I mean, if you're talking about a big compromise, right? There's two things, and one is sort of what is the sort of objective correlation of, of political power at the moment. Well, right? at the moment, so, it's I mean, all Democrats. So, yeah, like I say, well, it but really so matter. I mean, so now, if there were to be a compromise, it would be a compromise that was tilted in the direction of, of what Democrats want, sure. I think more likely Republicans would need to recover some more political power right. to make it, you know, worth people's while to, right. to, to compromise. Well, we're uh, in kind of land here where, you know, big... big right, I mean, I mean, what, what you were suggesting would be a, a you know, I mean, a, a huge giveaway for, for Democrats who, who don't really need to, need to make it right. in the short term. Right. Um, but, you know, it's the, the operations of the American... Congress, to me at least, just do not inspire a huge amount of confidence in, you know, in, in anything. We can right? agree. I mean, what, yes. I, right. I mean, so you know, what, whatever you thought about Obama's stimulus proposal, I don't think anyone thought, oh, when the congressional committees get through changing this, it's going to be a lot better, right? Right. right. I agree with that. You, you know, and and that's the way it kind of goes with with everything, right? I mean, unfortunately, it. it it wasn't like George W. Bush's worst ideas, from my point of view, even, were the ones that, that got stopped in Congress, right? I mean, it, it, there, were, there was a tendency for sort of the, the, the bigger and, to some extent, more meritorious things that would come out of the administration to get killed there because it, it steps on someone's toes. Um, so, you know, I mean, this is why you have congressmen themselves um, always thinking about, well, you know, can we appoint a commission, something like that, um, get some way, you know, somehow take this out of our hands. Um, but, you know, I, I just don't know. I mean, how much how much can you really get done through that mechanism um, before the system breaks down versus, you know, does Congress need to find some way to, you know, reform its own procedures? Well. Uh, I think we can agree that we will. Uh, we were taught. We started this discussion by saying that we're getting older, uh, and I think we'll be much older still. We'll be doing blogging heads. Who knows? By the, by the time Congress actually starts reforming itself, uh, and sure. we'll be uh, doing these uh, dialogues on holograms. But um, we'll be getting ready for our Medicare. <laughs> actually, you're right. But we'll have much more invested in the debate <laughs> then because we're about, we'll exactly. be about to go exactly. on it. But um, yeah, it's gonna uh, be great. why don't we leave it at that, uh, Matt Iglesias? Okay. It's been uh, it's been very re interesting to me uh, to get your thoughts on a lot of these topics. I've enjoyed this discussion. Well, thank you. I think we had good good discussion. Okay. Thanks, and, Matt. And uh, you know maybe we'll serve on a commission someday. One day we can only hope. <laughs> bye bye. Exactly. Bye.